I have mowed this property this year 37 times. <laughs> Not that I kept count. I just, I, it's a rough estimate. <laughs> 37 times. I only fainted once on a 95 degree day. <laughs> well, I'd like to introduce to you uh, someone who most of you may know. Tom Perry is, in my opinion, the ultimate source of information on Jeb Stewart. Written several wonderful books. I own all of them uh, and have read all of them. And he even managed to autograph one of them for me, and I appreciated that. But uh, Tom, uh, his, his family was. Uh, owner, previous owners of this property, and so he has a, a vested interest, and he uh, truly knows the subject. And I'd like you to welcome Tom. And take over. For all of you who were expecting Jefferson Davis, I apologize. <laughs> uh, Ronnie Haynes asked me to come and talk about the history of this property, which is something we don't do much. Uh, it's really good to see everybody out here today. They dedicated a marker this morning to me and the original board members, and uh, I lost it. I knew I would. I lost it. Uh, but it's really glad to see everybody. So we're going to talk about uh, the history of this property, uh, and I'm going to tell you things I know about it. Before I do that, let me uh, point out somebody who just showed up. Ladies and gentlemen, Jib Stewart's great, great, grandson, John. <laughs> and if you look at him real good and you look at pictures of Jeb and his brother William Alexander Stewart, you will be absolutely amazed at the family resemblance between them. Uh, <laughs> John, you ever see Steve Willis anymore? You remember old Steve? You used to work with him a long time ago. Do you really? Yeah, he grew up here. Steve grew up here. Well, he, he's at Virginia Beach pretending to be a defense contractor or something, I think. But anyway, uh, for most, most of my adult life, or even before my adult life, this place just fascinated me. Uh, my mother said when I was about 10 years old that uh, I was just became obsessed with the historic marker that was out here at the road. It was the only thing that was here. That and Shook Brown's cows. It was a cow pasture, and the only thing here was that marker, which was put up, I think, in December of 1932, but I believe it was written by Douglas Southall Freeman, the great biographer of Robert E. Lee. And that was the only thing that was here, the only thing you would know that the uh, Stewarts had even lived here uh, on this property. Across the river, though, well, it was a little different situation. Across the river is the grave of William Letcher. And William Letcher was Jeb Stewart's great-grandfather. And William Letcher in the summer of 1780 was killed by a Tory, a pro-British sympathizer, in front of his wife and baby daughter. Uh, the Civil War and the American Revolution, I think, was much worse than the Civil War that we're here talking about this weekend. They came and killed him right in front of his wife and daughter. His wife was Elizabeth Perkins Letcher, and she came from Pennsylvania County over near Danville, and they had had a little girl, Bethania Letcher. William Letcher had come from up near Richmond. He died when he was about 30 years old. Keep that thought in mind. He died when he was about 30 years old. If Jeb Stewart came back today, the only thing on this whole property that he would recognize is the grave of his great-grandfather, who died almost the same age that he would die in his own revolution you might say. So if Stuart was here, that would be the only thing he would recognize. I encourage you to go across the river onto Letcher Lane and have a look and visit with William. Uh, the boxwoods, we believe the Stuart uh, planted are over there near his grave too. It's the oldest marked grave in this county. When William Letcher was killed, it wasn't even this county. It was Henry County. And now it's Patrick. So uh, politicians haven't changed. They all like to see their names on stuff. Patrick, Henry, Uh, but uh, he was killed, like I said. When he died, George Harston from over near Martinsville came over and got Mrs. Letcher and the baby and took her back to Martinsville. And uh, for whatever reason, he married her. And uh, 
I think they had nearly a dozen children uh, from that marriage. I don't know if it was one of them things where he spent the night out on the road with her and married her because of honor and all that kind of thing, but he married her and had a bunch of children with her. And uh, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Uh, but that little girl, Bethania Letcher, who was just a baby when her father died, uh, she grew up and she married uh, David Panel. And David Panel, of course, is, uh, if you know anything about Henry County, the panels ended up being uh, big in the textile uh, industry. And uh, William Letcher Panel and his sister, Elizabeth Letcher Panel, were the uh, children of that marriage. And uh, Elizabeth Letcher Panel was, of course, going to marry Archibald Stewart. And that's how we get here, is uh, Jeb Stewart's mother is the reason we're at this property today because she inherited it from her father or her grandfather William Letcher who died during the revolution so again the only thing that Jeb Stewart would have recognized if he came back today is his great-grandfather's grave and think about the stories he must have heard about his great-grandfather you know, dying in the American Revolution dying fighting for his cause something he believed in and I think that probably had a profound effect on him. I've never seen him actually say that, but it's hard to imagine to me that he didn't really live off of that. And uh, so that's uh, one of my theories about th this whole thing. Archibald and Elizabeth Letcher Panel Stewart, gosh, these Elizabeths are hard to keep up with. <laughs> y'all have that problem, I see y'all nodding back. <laughs> uh, now, Lucy, tell me exactly now, you're related to William Letcher Panel, is that it? Yeah. Granddaughter. Granddaughter of William Letcher Panel, right there. Uh, Jeb Stewart's uncle, would have been Jeb Stewart's uncle. Lord, keeping up with this genealogy is too much. <laughs> Somebody ought to write a book about that. Oh, well, maybe I did, never mind. <laughs> Uh, first book I ever wrote 20 years ago was about the genealogy of Jeb Stewart. And I did it because I was tired of everybody asking me questions about the genealogy of Jeb Stewart. Lord have mercy, what was I thinking? <laughs> We're 50 books in now, I think, something like that. But uh, anyway, I've got a couple of my books. I'll show them to you and we'll talk about some of the stuff. This is my favorite book. It's The Dear Old Hills of Patrick. It's about Jeb Stewart and this property and it tells the story of his family from the time they get to North America up through the day, and the last chapter is how we tried to save this place. So if any of you are interested, I'm right over there in that blue tent, uh, and I'll be happy to talk to you. I have a new book out, which is uh, brand new, and it's uh, a portrait of Jeb Stewart. As some of you know, our Judge Martin Clark several years ago took the portrait of Jeb Stewart down from his courtroom in Patrick County, and shall we say all heck broke loose and uh, this book is about that it's also about the high school in fairfax county which changed the name from jeb stewart to justice high school and the other part of this book is about the uh, statue on monument avenue so what i did here is i tried to go through and tell the stories about these things from my perspective and not necessarily what you get on cnn but it's more about the true history of all this stuff. And uh, John, your brother, ends this book. We let Jeb V have the final word. I don't think he knows he has the final word in this book, but we'll send him one home with you if you want to. But uh, John's brother, Jeb, who was an uh, orthopedic surgeon in Richmond, uh, wrote, which I thought was kind of a brave editorial about how we should use these statues to interpret history and talk about history. And uh, shall we say, uh, Jeb V got skewered a little bit in the Richmond paper. Imagine that. Imagine that. But I, I, was, I was a little proud of him because, you know, he didn't have to do that. And I think they have really tried to help the birthplace get the statue of Jeb Stewart moved here. And boy, wouldn't he look good right behind me up here on this hill. Man alive, he'd look good. Uh, so anyway, where was I? Oh, I was in the 1820s. Never mind. So Archibald and Elizabeth Stewart come here in the mid-1820s. They came here because I think literally Archibald Stewart lost the family farm. He was not a very good businessman. He was a lawyer. He was a politician. And there's all kinds of stories about how Mrs. Stewart, Elizabeth, 
was the one who kept the things together. She apparently had a very good sense of business and uh, she, uh, she made all her sons, for instance, promise her that they would not drink. Uh, now, I don't know if that's a reflection on Archibald Stewart or not, but it sure seems like it. It sure seems like it. And Jeb Stewart, to my knowledge, uh, never got drunk in his entire life, was a complete teetotaler. He wasn't just a teetotaler, ladies and gentlemen. He was in uh, what you would call the early stages of temperance. He actually, in Kansas, when he was in the U.S. Army, would uh, have meetings because alcoholism in the U.S. Army was a terrible problem for them. And Jeb would have almost AA meetings, I guess, in the U.S. Army while he's out in Kansas. But he took it very seriously, and he promised his mother he wouldn't drink, and the best I can tell, he really never did. Uh, he also did some things that, that kind of blows, blows the people's minds when I tell them. Is uh, Jeb Stewart was a very, very devout Christian man. Uh, people think of him, I think, as the life of the party. But Jeb Stewart uh, was a sober life of the party. Uh, he didn't just do that. He, he actually founded a couple of churches in his lifetime. One of them still out in Junction City, Kansas. If you go out there, you walk in the front door, and there's this big plaque that says, this church founded by Lieutenant J.E.B. Stewart. That brings us back to beautiful downtown Ararat here today. He wrote his mother a letter one time when he was in the Army and uh, asked her to put up $100. And he was going to put up $100 to build a comfortable log church here in Ararat because he said he never saw a place that needed one so bad. <laughs> <laughs> and it's funny now, uh, 30 years ago, I couldn't get anybody to talk about that. Now I think every church in Ararat thinks they're that church. <laughs> but, uh, but he actually did that. And when Mrs. Stewart sold this property, she put an acre aside for a small, comfortable log church. And I don't think anyone ever took her up on that, but just to show you how serious he was uh, about his faith. Uh, he would buy his men copies of the scripture and give them out to him when he was in the war in 61 to 65. If you read his letters, you will see Jeb Stewart almost, he almost sounds like Stonewall Jackson rather than Jeb Stewart where he's giving you know all the glory to God. But uh, it's a different side of him. He's a much more complex fellow than the, I think the image we have of him. A lot of people want Jeb Stewart to be, oh, he's just riding around getting in trouble and losing the Battle of Gettysburg. Well, that's not necessarily true. He, uh, he was a very serious man. He was a very well-educated man. He started here at a little local school uh, with, a, I think, a, a teacher named Monday. Uh, not Monday, Cole, Monday. <laughs> Uh, Cole Snyder gives me a hard time when I start talking air rat. I'll say Monday instead of Monday. Uh, this younger generation, what can you do with it? Uh, <laughs> but uh, he started off here about 1845 when he was 12 years old. They sent him up to Withful to go to school. The reason they sent him to Withful, Virginia, is because the man he's named for, Judge James Yule Brown, he's James Yule Brown Stewart, was his uncle. And he was a judge up there in Wythe County. And uh, Judge Brown kind of took the Stewart boys under his wing. Uh, John Dabney Stewart, William Alexander Stewart, and Jeb Stewart all went up there, and uh, Judge Brown helped them, got them started in life. And Stewart spent about three years around Withful going to school. He ended up in, I think, Draper Valley for a little while. And uh, he then, in 1848, went to Emory and Henry College, where he became the first member of the Fighting Wasps, I guess, at Emory and Henry, which was a small and still is a Methodist school in southwest Virginia. I think what they were doing was I think they were probably grooming him to uh, go to West Point because as the youngest son, he wasn't going to inherit much. Uh, and you can be a lawyer, a doctor, or a military man. Well, Stewart gets an appointment to West Point in 1850, and uh, he goes to the United States Military Academy. But he spent two years at uh, Emory & Henry, which is, uh, is, a, is a nice little place to go. They got a McAdoo's. Y'all should go and check it out sometime if you're going to the Barter Theater. It's not too far from the Barter. 
But Stuart, uh, I love telling this because uh, uh, do we have any, any Hokies in the audience who will admit to being a Hokie in the audience today besides me? Okay, y'all ain't looking too good. Uh, got any Virginia Cavaliers here today? Any, any of y'all? Uh, so on the way to West Point, Jeb Stewart stops in Charlottesville. <clears throat> And uh, he goes around, he visits the students at the University of Virginia, and uh, it's all male, remember, there's no co-ed yet, they're all male, 1850. He goes up to Monticello, and he visits Thomas Jefferson's grave, and apparently this is what you did in the 1850s. He went up there and chipped off a piece of Mr. Jefferson's grave and took it home with him as a souvenir. Not the grave you see now, they obviously had to replace it, uh, but Jeb Stewart, uh, the vandal, uh, chipped off a piece of Thomas Jefferson's grave. Well, he goes back down to Charlottesville and he writes this letter home, and uh, you just don't know how much I enjoy telling this. Uh, he writes, uh, writes some of his cousins, the Harstons, and he says, uh, well, I'm having a great time here in Charlottesville. There's just one problem. It's these women, the women of Charlottesville. They are the ugliest of the ugly. <laughs> Now this goes over real big at hokey club meetings, <laughs> let me tell you. But he goes up to West Point in 1850 and is going to spend four years there. The uh, last two years he's at West Point, Robert E. Lee is the superintendent. And this will be where Stuart uh, and Robert E. Lee come together. Now Stuart I think is a frequent visitor to the Lee home. Uh, Robert E. Lee did have a lot of eligible daughters, as you might imagine. Uh, none of them ever married, although I think Jeb give it the college try. I think he tried, uh, especially with Mary, the uh, daughter Mary. He, uh, he tried and stayed friends with her pretty much the rest of his life. But uh, Robert E. Lee's uh, son Custis was in Jeb Stewart's class at West Point, and uh, he became very friendly. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, Robert E. Lee and Jeb Stewart's father Archibald had known each other. Archibald Stewart was a lawyer, like I said, here in Patrick County, and uh, Robert E. Lee and his brothers inherited a huge land grant from uh, their father, Light Horse Harry Lee, who uh, fought in the American Revolution, was George Washington's cavalry man, and uh, it was the Buffalo Mountain. If any of you know where the Buffalo Mountain is over in uh, Floyd and Carroll County, uh, the Lees actually owned a piece of that at one time, and Archibald Stewart and Robert E. Lee did some legal hashing about with all of that. So the Stuarts and the Lees knew each other quite a bit. But this is where Robert E. Lee really comes to know Jeb Stewart. He's a visitor to his house. He's probably no doubt flirting with his daughters. Uh, Mrs. Lee apparently really, really liked Jeb Stewart. And uh, so that's where they first meet. Stewart, interestingly enough, is gonna graduate 13th, I think out of 46 in the class of 1854. He is as high as sixth or seventh in his class before that last year. And the family tradition is that he let his grades slip because he didn't want to be an engineer. He wanted to be in the cavalry. And that's why his grades went down a little bit. That or he had a bad case of senioritis. I'm not, not sure which it was, but uh, he actually graduates 13th. And they send him out to Texas for a little while and the regiment of mounted rifles. And then the Secretary of War of the United States, the fellow who I'm supposed to be talking about, Jefferson Davis, uh, decides that he's gonna make two elite cavalry regiments, the 1st and 2nd United States Cavalry, and Jeb Stewart gets put in one of those. In fact, almost every general you ever heard of in the Civil War gets put in one of those. Robert E. Lee, I think Albert Sidney Johnston, Joe Johnston, they're all somehow, some way in these two elite Cavalry. You don't realize Jefferson Davis was considered by many to be one of the best secretaries of war, secretary of defense, as we ever had in this country. Although he did try to get camels in the U.S. Army at one time. I'm not sure what that was all about with Jeff. But, uh, but Jefferson Davis, I think, even then is recognizing the talent of some of these men who will come in very handy for him in, in a few years. So Stewart is now in Kansas territory. He's not... Uh, uh, he's not, it's not a state, it's still a territory. And of course what's happening in Kansas in the 1850s is the prequel to the Civil War, almost a civil war uh, in Kansas between pro and, and uh, anti-slavery people. 
and uh, who should Stuart encounter several times? Uh, he's going to encounter, of course, John Brown. And John Brown, I think as early as 1856, I believe Stuart will encounter him. There's a panel over here about a fellow named Henry Clay Pate. If you go and read it, one of the ones over here. Henry Clay Pate was at a place called Blackjack, Kansas, and got captured, I believe, by John Brown, and lived to tell about it. Uh, he didn't get the big broadsword.